you think of the fear of the Lord, do you think, uh, you know, God's going to beat me? God's going to whoop me? If I don't behave, I'm going to get a big stick across my backside? Is that your idea of the fear of the Lord? Well, I hope not, because God actually has much, much more in store for us than that kind of a relationship. That kind of relationship is not what he had in store uh, at all uh, for us. There seems to be some situation going on with getting the uh, video or the uh, PowerPoint going. I'm waiting on you guys. There we go. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. In looking at this idea, this, this thought of the fear of the Lord, just want to bring to your mind Pee-wee. No, not Pee Wee Herman, for those of you that remember that. No. This man's name, they called him Pee Wee, but Pee Wee wasn't his real name. He was born in 1900, and his name had actually been given to him back uh, as a young child. And even as an adult, he wasn't very big. He was only about five foot, uh, six inches tall, not very big in any standard. And so that name stuck with him from childhood on into adulthood. And as an adult, when you heard people call him Pee-wee, you realize they weren't attacking him, they weren't teasing him, they weren't picking on him at all. That's just what he went by. And again, though it might have been given to him as a tease to begin with, as an adult, he, he wore it proudly, not a derogatory term at all. He was actually the father of uh, 14 children. Uh, two of those children died in infancy. He had uh, four daughters, and he had eight sons. And uh, the fact is, his real name was John Telesphore Landry. He was my grandfather. <laughs> the picture that you see up there, this charming couple in your upper uh, left-hand side, is my mom and dad. And uh, I was going to take time and let you guess which one is me down there and all of the grandchildren, but you would never guess the fact that I'm that beautiful, bouncing boy in my grandfather's lap. That's why this is one of my favorite family pictures of all time. That's me at about three months old. So uh, he was, at that point in time, uh, younger than I am now. He was uh, 58 years old at that point, or 54 years old, 54 years old. John Telesphore, it's a weird name, that, that middle name Telesphore, it's actually, there, there's a Greek name Telesphorus, and it has the meaning of bringing fulfillment or bearing fruit, and I think that as you look at that picture, you realize he did pretty good at that bearing fruit part, you know. <laughs> Uh, and as a matter of fact, not all the cousins have been born yet. There's a lot more there. There's cousins I haven't seen. Cousins I haven't seen. Uh, there's just a whole lot of them out there. Well, uh, by the time he was uh, 68 years old, actually, uh, he passed away. I was in high school at that point in time. I was uh, 15 years of age. And I was so amazed that as a 15-year-old, uh, at that funeral to see so many people come up and pay their respects to this man that to me uh, seemed just so unassuming and so quiet by and large. When I was younger, uh, I was actually able to spend uh, a lot of time with my grandpa. Um, we lived in Louisiana until I was about five, and then after that, we would travel back and forth Louisiana just about every summer, just about either every Easter or Christmas, one of the two. So a couple of times a year, I'd be able to be back there, spend some time with my grandfather. He would take us uh, uh, what's called crabbing. Uh, anybody know what crabbing is? He'd take us out on the docks on the bayous of southern Louisiana. We'd go crabbing. We'd be there all day. By the time we got back, we were as red as the crabs were. Uh, one of the other fun things was he would always buy us fireworks. Uh, he lived out in the country, and we just did fireworks. Every major holiday and some not-so-major holidays, if fireworks were on sale, he'd get us some fireworks. Uh, he loved, I think, the uh, bottle rockets, and we did a lot of those. We'd also help him uh, do a lot of chores uh, as I was growing up while we were there in the summer. I think he realized, man, I got all these kids. I'm going to go ahead and get some free labor here. And so we helped him do his chores, and if we... Uh, 
uh, had the opportunity, we got to ride in the back of his 1960 Ford Ranchero. That Ford Ranchero, uh, again, I, I wish it was still around. Uh, it was beat up, um, abused, but man, it, what a great memory it was. One of our most fun trips was actually to be able to go to the town dump with him in that Ranchero. We'd ride in the back of the Ranchero. Since he was the only one in the neighborhood with a quote-unquote truck, he would take the trash barrels of all the neighbors and uh, just out of the kindness of his heart, drive them down to the dump and dump them off. And as I said, we got to ride in the back of the ranchero with all the trash. What a blast as a kid, right? <laughs> then when we'd get to the dump, uh, he'd made a stay in the back while he dumped the barrels off and he'd keep one eye on us and one eye on the dump because one of the things about the dump was there was these huge, huge wild hogs that were everywhere around that dump. And I think that they would love to have fresh young meat uh, uh, to munch on. So we had to stay in the back of the truck while he did all the dumping. Well, as fun as it was to be with him and all the variety of things that we were able to do with him, there was one thing for certain. You did not want to get on the wrong side of this Louisiana country boy. You just did not want to do it. They say that before he came to Christ, he was a, quote, hell raiser, risk taker, and, well, he was, he was a risk taker. He did a lot of things he should not have done, okay? But I didn't know him at that point. He came to Christ before I was born, or at least before I grew of any age where I actually realized it. Uh, fortunately for me and, and, and most of my cousins, we came to know him after he came to Christ. He, he was, man, a gentle man at that point in time. Loved his grandkids, totally loved my grandmother, uh, absolutely adored her, did so much for her. Uh, I could just tell you story after story after story. And yet with all that gentleness, we knew that within him there was still this strength, there was this, uh, this, this fierceness about him that you didn't want to go poking okay? Uh, it, was, it was contained, it was maintained, but you did not want to poke him and push him to any way. Well, now, my, my brother and some of my older cousins, they actually found that out the hard way. Um, but my, my grandfather introduced them actually personally to what is known as a razor strap. Anybody familiar with razor straps? Yes. That was the day, okay? Um, anymore, you would be arrested and thrown in jail for a long time. But for, for uh, my, my grandfather owned a barbershop in Hammond, Louisiana. It was Pee Wee's Barbershop in downtown Hammond, Louisiana. And in that barber shop, he had multiple of these razor straps, and he would use them for, again, sharpening up his straight edge razors. But the interesting thing was, the ones that he had at home, a lot of times they kind of doubled as those instruments of instruction and discipline for not only some of his young kids, because I have uncles that are pretty close to my own age, uh, and, but as also the grandchildren, and he was not afraid to, again, bring in those instruments of instruction and discipline whenever they were necessary. Uh, if you weren't able to learn, you would come to know those razor straps personally in a very uh, intimate way. But if you could learn at all, you realize you just did not push the gentleness and the love of Grandpa. As a matter of fact, most of us learn pretty early to have both a great love and a great respect for Grandpa. Well, most of us learned anyway. Tonight, I want us to look at, as I said, the fear of the Lord. To consider that concept for a moment, and, and for me personally, the reason I brought this all out about my family is every time I think of the fear of the Lord, my mind goes back to my grandfather. My mind goes back to him for a whole lot of reasons, but as I shared, there was something about him that simply drew us to have not only love and respect for him, but also I have this mix of a healthy fear. Because again, you knew that there were lines that you did not uh, go over. Lines that you knew were there that you did not step across. 
The book of Proverbs, that, that great book of wisdom, uh, you know, for, I believe that it's a book of wisdom for all people of every culture down through the millennia. The book of Proverbs has great, great stuff. And the very first chapter of the book of Proverbs, the very first seven verses speak or bring out this idea of the fear of the Lord. So I invite you, if you would, to turn in, click in, or dial into your Bibles, whether they're electronic or dead tree version, or if you don't have one, you can lean over and cheat off your neighbor's King James, New King James, nearly inspired version, whatever they might have, to go ahead and get yourself to Proverbs chapter 1 as we look real quickly at the first seven verses. Now, I need to cover my reputation here tonight, just as I did with the men at the men's retreat a couple of weeks ago. I need to cover my reputation and allow, in, in, in order that you can receive the teaching tonight without me having a whole lot of further explanations down the road, I just need to give a little bit of a disclaimer here, okay? Uh, number one, I'm going to be quoting from outside sources. Number two, uh, I, I really am not uh, reformed in my theology, but I am going to be quoting from R.C. Sproul. Uh, I normally teach out of the New King James Version, but I have a couple of quotes here from the message, and uh, we'll be sharing those tonight. <laughs> And just as I said, I, I, I borrowed heavily from, from others' works, but you need to understand, to, to borrow from one person is plagiarism. To borrow from multiple sources, that's research, okay? <laughs> so I've done some research in the midst of this, and I can pretty well say, along with King Solomon tonight, that there is nothing new under the sun, and as he says, is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It's already been in ancient times before us. Solomon shares that with us. So with those disclaimers, uh, we'll go on into the words of Solomon there in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Uh, Solomon writes, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wisdom and counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Oh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. First of all, I want you to know, I'm not going to, don't, don't be worried, we're not going to exegete the whole passage, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but I do want you to see, I do want you to understand what Solomon is speaking here uh, in these opening words, because of the greatness of this wisdom, I believe it's, it's necessary for us to at least have a good grasp on it as we go into, again, sharing about the fear of the Lord. First thing, we see that, yeah, these are the words of Solomon. And what was Solomon uh, declared as the wisest man in all the world? However, you got to understand that Solomon's example, that just because you have wisdom doesn't mean you actually walk in wisdom. I mean, just because you have wisdom doesn't necessarily mean you're smart, okay? Because all you have to do is look at Solomon's life. I mean, let's face it, guys. This dude had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, how smart can that be? Especially the fact that they drew him away from his relationship with God. And in his old age, he had opened himself up to the worship of all these pagans. Wise? Yes, he was very wise. He wrote a tremendous amount of things, and all you need to do is go back and, and look and see all that Solomon did. But again, not too smart. The Lord gave him great and wise words to say. The problem is he was, in essence, telling, as he writes the book of Proverbs, he was, in essence, telling his children and for generations after that, do as I say and not as I do. How many of you heard that phrase before? 
Uh, how many of you parents don't, don't raise your hand? No. He tells us at the very beginning here why he's written these things down. He's written these wise sayings down in order that not only his children, but all that read them down through the ages would, would read them and actually heed, take, take heart to the words that he's written. That they would, as he says in verse 2, that they would know wisdom and instruction. That they would be able to perceive the words of understanding. Verse 3, it's throughout these pages, the reader and the heater is, is able to receive the instructions then of wisdom and of justice, of judgment and equity. Verse 4, that, that wisdom that's found in the words of Solomon will help to, to give prudence to the simple and to the young man, that they'd both be able to grow up in knowledge and discernment. In verse 5, real quick, as individuals read and as they heed these words, they, they'll, they'll find that just as a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel, well, once an individual has grown to that point of increased learning and understanding, then he can actually come to the point of, as verse 6 says, understanding a proverb, an understanding an enigma. And it's only then that we're able to receive the words of the wise and their riddles and actually come to understand them all, that it, that it makes sense. So people say, I read the Bible, it makes no sense to me. Well, what's your relationship with God? The interesting thing about the Word of God is the only way you're really going to understand it is by knowing the author. And the more you know of the author, the deeper understanding, the, the closer the relationship with the author, the more these words mean and the more you can draw from them, from the very depths of them. He wrote these things, not as some simple exercise, not because he had a blog post he had to post down there to get it down for, you know, 31 days. No, that wasn't what he was doing. There was a purpose behind it all. And Solomon, in all of his failings, in all of his weakness, he still understood that man gains wisdom. We're not born with wisdom. We have to gain it. We have to purposefully seek after it. We need to desire it within our lives. The unfortunate thing, we look at the world today and the vast multitude of people, they're not seeking wisdom. Oh, they may be seeking knowledge. And we're a smart, smart generation right now. But it's lacking woefully in wisdom. And we see that because it's lacking in a relationship with Almighty God. It's when we read and perceive or, or heed and, uh, to, to follow through with, with these words of truth that Solomon has for us here, that's where the blessing comes in. Not just, hey, I, I read my chapter today, boom, I'm gone. Or I read my three verses today, and boom, I'm gone. Or I've read through the Bible, you know, five times in the last six months. Uh, good for you. But are you heeding it? Is it making a difference in your life? Are you following what's there? The next verse there in, in Proverbs 1, verse 7, actually zeroes in on what we're going to be sharing tonight. Proverbs 1, verse 7, where he says that it's actually the fear of the Lord which is able to bring about knowledge. But fools despise wisdom, and fools despise instruction. And I want to take the last portion of the verse, uh, actually, first. Uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And you might be saying, who are you calling a fool? Well, anybody who does not heed to these words. And I don't have to call you a fool. Solomon calls you a fool. And it's not only Solomon, but I believe that God led Solomon to write these very words. So God is calling any who do not seek after him a fool. Now here, to, to help us understand this a little bit better, we actually go back to the writings of Solomon's dad. 
Solomon's dad, King David. And as King David writes, at least in a couple of places, real easy to see both in Psalm 14 and also Psalm 53, he writes almost the exact same words. David writes, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And then he goes on to speak about that fool. He says, they are corrupt. They've done abominable works, or as chapter 53 says, abominable iniquity, and there are none who do good. The fool who says there is no God, there is no good that he can do. This whole concept of refusing even to acknowledge God is so rampant in our society today. Our current culture is is just overwhelmed with this idea of getting God out of everything. And even when the, the, the most foolish of man's ideas come up and say, this is, is, is how the earth was formed. This is how man was, was, came about. And they can come up with the most bizarre deals. Why? Because they do not want to even acknowledge that there is a God. And yet, how long, even in this country... The teaching of the knowledge of God, the teaching of the work of God, the teaching of the creation of God, the teaching of the sovereignty of God was even in our school books. And now we say, no, there is none, and all of that was foolishness. So for generations, the greatness of our nation, the greatness of the individuals, statesmen, uh, the, 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 the power of the men and the women all down through the ages was because they believed in foolishness? Because they believed in fairy tales, because they believed in fantasies. The church was formed, established, and continued now for 2,000 years because they believed in fantasies, because they, 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 they believed in, in, in some fairy tale idea. No, you see, man is now trying to wipe out the reality and the truth of God, and he does it to his own harm. Once again, David's words, this time in Psalm chapter 10. In Psalm 10, he says in verse 4, the wicked in his proud countenance does not even seek God. As a matter of fact, God's not even in any of his thoughts. I don't even want to think about a God. Why would that be, church? Because if there's no God, I won't have to answer to him at the end of my day. If there's no God, when this carcass is done, it just goes to dust and oh well. Or they come up with the other ideas. We get reincarnated and I'll come back as, a, uh, I don't know, an Indian princess or something. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of anything except the fact that I'm going to stand before God. And I don't want that, so I'm not going to believe there's a God. I'm going to take God completely out of my processes. I think we can agree that when man denies that there is God, then there's definitely no fear of God within his life. James tells us that, as I shared it even this weekend, uh, even the demons believe that there's a God, and, and they have enough sense to even fear him. Now, they have a different fear than what we're speaking about here tonight. The demons have that kind of fear that, whoa, there's God. But for you and I, that's not the kind of fear that we're speaking of, and we'll get into that more as we go along. For man, if there is no fear of God, according to God's Word, according to what God's Word declares to us, they cannot even begin to receive the very beginning of knowledge. It was G. Campbell Morgan that that wrote that the fundamental fact then is that in knowledge, in all understanding of life, in all interpretation thereof, it is the fear of Jehovah that is the principal thing, the chief part, the central light, and apart from which the mind of man gropes in darkness and misses the way. And that's exactly what happened. What happens right now, as man continues to refuse God, he's groping in darkness, and he misses the way 
of the Lord, the one and only way. There's only one way. There's only one, one truth. And there be few that find that. Why? Because the multitudes refuse to accept the reality of God, and thus they reject the fear of God. Without the acknowledgement of God, there's no fear of God. Therefore, man is determined to be a fool of his own making. And therefore, because of that, he's actually despising truth and he's despising godly wisdom and instruction. And if man continues on in that direction, when he dies, he will die a fool's death. And that fool's death is a death without God. You want to deny God? That's the way you'll die. Without God in your life. But I guarantee you, after you breathe your last, you will stand before the reality and the truth of God. You'll not be with him in the way that, again, he desires you to be. He will stand as judge and not as loving father. So you might say, okay, David, I believe, I, I believe that there's God, uh, but let's get back to the point. What, what is the fear of the Lord? What does it actually mean to fear the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. So first of all, we need to, we need to realize that throughout the Bible, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, that word fear is actually used over 300 different times just in reference to God. Not that I'm fearing the enemy or I'm fearing this battle. No, in reference to God, 300 times, Old Testament, New. So I, I think that helps it to rank as one of the important things that we need to know about. When fear comes together with God 300 times within the Word, we ought to know what he's talking about. We ought to have some kind of an understanding. Now, tonight, we're only going to be able to cover just a small fraction. Don't worry. We're not going to cover all 300 verses. Some of you, I saw a little worried look on your face. No, we're, we're not going to go there. Uh, let, me, let me start, first of all, actually with a definition. This definition comes from uh, a Word Study Dictionary of the Old Testament. The Hebrew verb... Uh, yare can mean to fear, to respect, or to reverence. And the same word in its noun version, the Hebrew noun, yira, uh, usually refers to the fear of God. And it's almost always, in that aspect, viewed with a positive quality, in a positive way. So in other words, to have fear of God, it's a good thing most often when that word's used. Both the verb and the noun there of the Hebrew word for fear is used in Exodus 20, 20. And by putting them both in the same verse, it actually helps us to kind of see uh, what this fear uh, actually is and how it shows God's, actually his, his good intentions toward us. Exodus 20, verse 20. Moses said to the people, do not fear, Yare, for God has come to test you that his Yara may be before you, that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. It almost sounds like Moses is saying, don't fear her, I'm going to give you something to fear about. You know, that, anybody ever hear that as a kid? You don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. I don't know, that's, maybe that's just the way I was raised. But, uh, you know, razor straps and the whole deal. So, uh, but that's not the case. That's not what Moses is saying here. To kind of help us understand really what is happening here, we actually need to back up a couple of verses there in Exodus. Back up to Exodus chapter 20, back up to verse 18. In Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 18, we read there uh, again, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. Where are they at, church? Where are they at? Mount Sinai. And the getting ready of the giving of the law. Very, very fearful time, man. The, the mountain's rocking and rolling and smoking. and uh, I mean, it's just a crazy place. You don't want to be there. Great fear was upon them at that point in time. As a matter of fact, it says that when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood far off and they pointed to their leader. I love that. You just kind of put Moses out there. It says, you speak with us and we will hear. 
But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Because of what they were seeing, because of what they were hearing, and because they knew the sinfulness of their own hearts, the people of Israel figured that God was about to toast them. That again, uh, he knows who we are, and here we are standing before him, we're done for. Kind of like the idea of Isaiah standing before there in the, the throne room of heaven. Man, I, I, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah thought that he was done. The, the people of Israel thought that they were gone. But what we actually see then in those words that Moses gave them down in verse 20 and this is the David Landry version. Uh, most of you don't have this one. Uh, we do have it available for sale at the bookstore. No, not really. In essence, what Moses was saying is, don't be afraid, thinking that God's about to kill you. He wants you to come to know him in his fullness, to reverence him because of his holiness and respect him because of his great power. He desires that in you so that out of your reverence toward him, you won't continually keep sinning. That's that kind of fear and reverence. To help us understand it a little bit better, uh, uh, I, I quote from the message. Uh, in, in the message takes verse 20 and says, Don't be afraid. God has come to test you and instill in you a deep and reverent awe within you so that you won't sin. You see, you want to, because of respect and awe of the greatness and the majesty of who he is. Love, yes, and that comes into the mix too. But we're dealing with this whole idea of what is fear right now. When we get to the New Testament, we actually have the same sort of an idea. In the New Testament, the word for fear is most often the Greek word phobos. What do we get out of the Greek word phobos? Phobia, absolutely. And uh, I, I looked and there was like a, uh, a list of the hundred top phobias that uh, people uh, have to deal with. And number one in all of that was uh, arachnophobia arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. Now, it says that uh, women are four times more affected by that than men, unless you're the worship leader for Calvary Chapel, and Jake hates spiders, but uh, he's probably listening to me in the other room right now. Uh, number two on that list of 100 uh, is um, aphidiophobia, the fear of snakes, uh, Indiana Jones, and many others of us. The only good snake is a stick. Okay. Uh, the third one is acrophobia. Acrophobia is the fear of heights. Then there, number four is claustrophobia, the fear of small spaces. And number five is uh, mysophobia, not the fear of mice, but the fear of germs, okay? Number six is aerophobia. Don't worry, I'm not going through the whole 100. Uh, aerophobia, the fear of flying. You got to jump down to uh, number 31, and you find one that is theophobia. Theophobia, the irrational fear of God or religion. And I say the irrational fear because, number one, there is a rational fear of God, and it's not theophobia. Number 37, I have to throw this one in because it's a real one. I did not make this one up, but number 37 is phobophobia, <laughs> okay? The fear of fear. But seriously, guys, uh, back at the idea of fear. Uh, in, in Vine's uh, dictionary, uh, the, the Greek word uh, phobos can mean reverential fear of God, not just a mere fear of his power or his righteous uh, retribution. In other words, not just because you're going to get smacked, but again, a, a reverential fear of him. A, a, a wholesome dread of displeasing him. Now, we see that concept uh, 
pretty clear all through the New Testament. One place that we see it is actually uh, in Acts chapter 9, uh, speaking about the churches. It said in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And they walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they multiplied. I love that when you see both together the, the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. How can I have comfort if I'm in fear? And if I'm in fear, how can I have comfort? Because when you have a righteous fear of who God is, an understandable fear of who God is, there is great comfort and knowledge in, again, the security that comes in the greatness of who our God is, in that reverent respect of his majesty and of his might. Guys, that's when we have great comfort because we know that we are his children. And if we are his children and he is that great and that awesome, then what can man do to me? What, what do I have to be afraid of? What can come against me? Because the God that I serve, the God who is my father, is greater than all these things. An attitude of reverent respect. Once again, the message. The message states it this way. They were permeated with a deep sense of reverence for God. And the Holy Spirit was with them, strengthening them, edifying them, strengthening them. R.C. Sproul, I told you I'd get to R.C. I like a lot of his stuff. Uh, not all of it, but a whole lot of it. Well, R.C. shares with us uh, actually the struggle that uh, Martin Luther had with this whole idea of the fear of the Lord. He, Martin Luther, a uh, strong Catholic, and man, the Catholic idea and understanding of fear is, uh, you know, the nuns are going to whack your, your knuckles. Uh, that's the kind of fear of God that was put in there. Well, Luther, uh, in his journey to uh, saving faith, really struggled with this idea of fear. And R.C. Sproul uh, lets us know that in that struggle with fear, he distinguished between what he called servile fear and filial fear. Servile fear and filial fear. Now the servile fear is a kind of fear that a prisoner in a torture chamber has for his tormentor, the jailer or the executioner. Luther writes that it's that kind of dreadful anxiety in which someone is frightened by the clear and present danger that is represented by another person. Or it's the kind of fear that a slave would have at the hands of a malicious master who would come with whip and torment the slave. Sproul goes on to say that Luther distinguished between that kind of fear and what he called filial fear. And the filial fear actually draws from the Latin word or concept, the idea of a family. It refers to actually having a, a healthy fear that a child would have for a good father. Okay? In that regard, Luther is thinking of a child who has tremendous respect and love for his father, for his mother, who dearly wants to please them because of the greatness of his love. He has a fear or an anxiety of offending the one he loves. Not because he's afraid of torture or punishment, but rather because he's afraid of displeasing the one who is, in that child's world, the source of security and love. That's the concept of the fear of the Lord that you and I need to understand. Not the concept that he's ready to beat us, but the concept that he loved us, even as sinners, so much that he gave himself for us. And out of that kind of respect, out of that kind of love, we want to serve him. We don't want to displease him. It's interesting when you see this played out in the process of our uh, children or our grandchildren's lives. You can actually see this kind of heart in some children, not all children, but some, when they, when they realize that they've, they've done something 
that displeased their parents, and they're actually more brokenhearted over that fact than in any kind of a coming punishment. They're just broken that uh, you know they we they've displeased their parents. Uh, I don't know if my children will. Uh, see uh, this on the internet or not, or uh, none of you are allowed to tell them. I'm going to tell a story on them real quick. Uh, my son, who's now 45 and a pastor uh, in Texas, uh, as he grew up, uh, when he did something wrong, and he did many things wrong, but when he did something wrong and we came on him, he was broken. He, he was, man, he was just, man, he was, he was almost in tears. Why? Because he knew that he had displeased us. Our daughter, I love her to pieces. We wore out three paddles by the time she was five. But uh, it's, it's two different heart attitudes that you see there. But that attitude of, again, I, I don't want to displease because of the respect and because of the greatness of the love. Now, Sproul goes on to tell us that in our Christian walk, in our very life, we need to always maintain this continual, this growing sense of awe and respect for the majesty of God. He states that it's, that's that very kind of thing is often lacking in contemporary evangelical Christianity. We get very flippant. Uh, we get cavalier with God uh, as if we had a casual relationship with him as the Father. He says, yes, we are invited uh, to call him Abba, Father, we are invited to have a personal relationship, to have personal intimacy that's promised to us, but we're still not to be flippant with God. I asked the question, at least in one of the services this last weekend, how many of you have heard the, the phrase, uh, me and the man upstairs? You know, man, that, that is a flippant attitude of the greatness of who God is. Uh, there was an old country song that uh, uh, I had to be so young when I heard this. But uh, anyway, it was uh, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. And uh, again, a flippant attitude about who God is and the majesty and the greatness of the Lord Jesus. Sproul says, we always are to maintain a healthy respect and adoration for him. There's a lot of verses, Old Testament and New, that we could turn to. And again, uh, 300 uh, times fear in relationship with God. As I said, we're not going to cover them all tonight, but I do. I encourage you, yourself, what a great study that would be just to look at the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. But let me wrap this up with another passage uh, from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses uh, 12 through 13. And now, Israel, what does Jehovah your God require of you? But to fear Jehovah, fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him. Did you catch that? You fear him, yet you love him. That's the greatness and the majesty of who our God is. We fear the Lord your God to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God, and with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. You know, everything that God calls for us to do is for our own good? Isn't that wild? Oh, no, God's just mistreating me. No, he's not. He's, he's, he, he might bring discipline to you like a loving father disciplines his children. Very unloving father lets their child go about whatever way that they want to go. One of the greatest ways to find out about, again, the original sin and, again, the, the sinfulness of man is to not discipline your child. You're going to find out pretty soon that, again, the greatness of sin within their lives. No, a loving father disciplines his children. And God does that to us, but at the same time, he even disciplines us for our own good. 
every blessing that our lives bring to God brings a blessing actually back down on us. He works in us, yes, for his good pleasure. But in the midst of that, guys, the blessings come on us. Our God is an awesome God. He's powerful over all of his universe. He's able to destroy to the uttermost, any that would, that would come up against him, any that, that, would, that would dare stand with their fist shaking at him, and yet in his long suffering and in his patience, not wishing that any would perish, God still puts up with the sinfulness of man because he is long suffering, because he is merciful, because his kindness is everlasting. Therefore, you and I, we who call ourselves his children, we need to honor him with respect, with awe, with obedience, with faithfulness, with reverent worship. Oh, it doesn't mean we don't get excited in our worship sometimes, but I'm talking about not the worship so necessarily that we might do when we come together corporately, but I'm talking about the worship that is your life 24-7, a reverent worship of him, worthy of his might, worthy of his power, worthy of his great love and his mercy. It was in a scene from the great Christian classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. The Beaver family speaks to the sons and the daughters of Adam. And if you haven't read these books, you're not going to really understand all of this, but bear with me for a moment. The Beavers are actually speaking to people. Uh, you got to read it. Okay. Anyway. The beavers are talking to the sons and daughters of Adam about the great lion, Aslan. Aslan is an allegorical representation of Christ himself. Okay? And Mrs. Beaver explains to them, Aslan is a lion. He's the lion. The great lion. Ooh said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And then Mr. Beaver responds. He says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And that king that Mr. Beaver and Mrs. Beaver spoke about has called us to receive his greatness, the greatness of his love, the greatness of his compassion, the fullness of his mercy, the fullness of his forgiveness. When we go by faith, to receive that completed work that he, the true one, Christ himself, offered as he gave his life, given as a sacrifice for our sin on the cross. And then God received and God validated that sacrifice by raising him from the dead. And referring to the time of the children of Israel when they met God at Mount Sinai, and then comparing that now to Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. I said that Deuteronomy passage was the last one. I lied. Uh, there's one more. Hebrews chapter 12, and this is the last one. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews says, you have not come now to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest to the sound of the trumpet and the, the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. 
And if so much as a beast touched that mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now, you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Guys, the truth of the proverb rings absolutely true. The fear of of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And until man comes to that point of having, first of all, that fear of judgment in order that he might repent and turn from his sin, he'll never come to the knowledge of forgiveness. But then even once we come to the knowledge of forgiveness, That fear, which is the awesome respect for the greatness and the might and the majesty of who he is, that needs to continue to grow in our lives. And guys, the more you grow in the knowledge of him, the more you understand his greatness. And the more you understand his greatness and the more you understand his majesty, I believe the more you'll be awed by his grace, by his love, and by his mercy, which he has lavished on us. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you that you are a good, good God. But you are also an awesome and awe-filled God full of awe, full of majesty, full of might. Father, let us come into your presence with the respect that's due your name. Let us cry out to you, Father, with the knowledge that you, you, you say that we can come to you as Abba, Daddy, that we can rush into your presence and into your courtroom. But let us also understand that in the midst of that, you are the great and mighty King. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Just as we're worthy of being put to death, being made toast, other than the blood of Christ that's cleansed us from all unrighteousness, which allows us to enter into that holy place, which allows us to come into your presence. And Father, as you look at us, you see us not from this perspective. You see us from the perspective of the blood of Christ, washed and cleansed. Father, may we be a people who honor you, who love you, who obey you because of the greatness of who you are, because you're worthy of our praise, you're worthy of our obedience, but also, Father, because of the greatness of our love and our growing love for you. May the Lord Jesus be edified in our lives. May the testimony of our lips declare his name to a lost and dying generation. May the light of our life pierce the darkness that's all around us. And Father, may your kingdom continue to grow until you call a halt to all these things and we enter into your kingdom eternal rest. Father, let us work now, for the night is coming where we won't be able to work. Time is coming either if our life is cut short or rather your trumpet blows and you take us to yourself. Father, let us be found faithful, obedient for the glory of Christ and the honor of his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.